you're wondering why I'm a little immobile today. This past week I did something to my back, my shoulder, something. <clears throat> and uh, I can either take enough Advil and ibuprofen that it doesn't hurt, or I can form a complete sense. <laughs> Y'all have never heard me preach when I can't form a complete sense. <laughs> it's not pretty. I, uh, one year at Easter, I had a kidney stone, and I had narcotics. <laughs> I'm still afraid to watch that video. <laughs> Continuing uh, forward with the lo looking at some of the things the, the Southern Baptist Convention we've been encouraged to uh, look at this challenge and, and last week we distributed the prayer guides and, and if you didn't get one and you don't know what's going on with these uh, feel free to grab one and then ask that question later uh, but the prayer guides the who's your one emphasis the idea that we all have at least one person or we should have at least one person that we can carry the gospel to, that we can engage with and spread the gospel to as we fulfill the Great Commission. And, uh, well, I didn't use, last week I used most, most of the, the recommended sermon points. This week I didn't, the recommended sermon was going to take all day. Um, and I decided I didn't want to do that. Besides, there were some other things that, that I wanted to, to, uh, to draw in. But this is one of the, the emphases. This is something we want to be thinking about as we go and as we, we plug into things because we're about to hit that, that point in the calendar where you're going to blink and then it's going to be September because next week is Mother's Day and so some of y'all will be here, some of y'all will be gone with Mama. Other people are going to be here because they're here with Mama but this is Mother's Day and then we've got Graduate Recognition Sunday, as we recognize those who, who are graduating from high school. Uh, and those of you, if you're going through that in your family life, and you've got a, got a high school graduate, you've got all this stuff going on to get ready for that. I know Olivia's is Thursday, so it's like, oop, wait a minute. It's supposed to be Thursday a year from now, not you know, two years from now, three years. Anyway, it's not, we're, not there yet. we're not there yet, but it's going to hit us like a baseball bat this week. Uh, you know, and then we've got college graduations and high school graduations. Uh, Sheridan, the uh, Saline County homeschoolers. I know uh, Bryant and all that neck of the woods starts. All these graduations start start to hit. And then it's Memorial Day weekend, and then it's summertime, and then everybody's gone to everywhere. Um, and what I want to try to encourage you to do. One of the reasons that we're hitting this now. So I want to encourage you as you go through your summer, make it a part of your intention as you go through all of that chaos to be looking for opportunities to share the love of Christ with the people you come in contact with. Because you'll see different people. You'll encounter different <laughs> uh, situations and different opportunities. And so we want to hit this before it just goes completely chaotic. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 5 beginning with verse 17. And so as we look at this... Uh, I'll let Gary try to keep the slides up with me. I'm trying to read too fast. On one of those days while he was teaching, the he there is Jesus, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was in him. Then some men came, carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and lowered him on the stretcher, through the roof, into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, who always managed to find something negative to say, began to think to themselves, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, Why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Get up and walk! But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded, and they were giving glory to God. 
And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. So this story comes in Luke, context-wise. It comes fairly soon after the calling of the disciples. That's in chapter 4. Then Luke gives us this. And we also get the idea here in Luke's gospel. And Luke is our, our third gospel writer. It's the third book into the New Testament. Luke is also the one who writes the book of Acts and, and draws those connections. He is, we think, we, we see him as he's a physician. Uh, we tend to sometimes look back in the ancient world and think that doesn't mean much, but it actually did. There's a lot of education involved in that, a lot of training, and a lot of responsibility in that situation. He writes a careful history that's addressed to Theophilus, and we don't know who Theophilus is, but we would love to find out uh, more about that. We'd love to see if he, you know, if Luke sent him anything else in terms of, you know, he sent the book of Luke and the book of Acts. You know, the question is, you know, did he maybe also send him some pictures or, you know, some Polaroid snapshots of, of the journey? Because Luke, Luke, we know travels with Paul. It'd be great, you know, if we had, you know, if we got his, you know, his camera roll, we'd be able to catch up on that. But this is, where, this is where this fits, and this is at the early part of Jesus' ministry at a time when he is teaching. And it's, it's a time that they are used to the idea, you know, one of these days, well, he, one of those days while well, he was teaching. Catch that in the first verse. One of those days while he was teaching, just one of those, it's a fairly common thing. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law have come, and this is a time when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are still listening. still listening. They haven't decided at this point that Jesus is a, is, is a threat. They're not sure what to make of him, but they're at least listening to him. They've come, they're, they're listening, they're coming, they're asking questions, but then things start to happen. Now, I grew up in church, and so I've heard this story a lot of times. We taught, we used this one, we learned this one when we were in RAs when I was a kid. You know, a boys program to learn about missions, and you know, we, we talked about it in youth group. I don't know how many times when I was a youth minister, I used this story to try to you know get youth doing the right things. Uh, we've talked about it in, in other times, preached it, and, and so there's some familiarity here for me, and maybe for you if you grow up in church. But I want you to look at the story again, make sure that you're getting what's here. Jesus is teaching; he's got a house full of people who are listening to him. Some of them listening with open ears, some of them are listening maybe with critical ears, but the place is crowded. But by now, his reputation not only as a teacher, but as a healer is out there. And so these guys pick up their friend who is paralyzed, and we don't know any backstory on him. We don't know why he's paralyzed, we don't know how long he's been paralyzed. Some people that we, that we see Jesus heal in the Gospels, we see that information. We see this is a man who's born blind. Yeah. We see that this person has had this problem, that this lady's had this disease for 12 years. We see that this has occurred and that has occurred. This guy, all we know is he's paralyzed. His friends load him up on a stretcher, and they want to get him through the crowd to Jesus for Jesus to heal. But the crowd is in the way. Now, starting here, we start to pick up all the different ways that this passage gets applied. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Sometimes used to criticize the crowd. But at the same time, if Jesus is teaching, you know, you're looking in that direction. You're not necessarily looking at what's going on behind you. But we should still be aware of the world around us and the needs. There, but the people there didn't. And sometimes if you get a crowd, if you've ever been in a seriously crowded situation, you can want to park the waves for somebody to come through all day long. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can. Now, we don't see a whole lot of that, you know, even in the United States in general, because usually we can spread out. But there are times, you think about downtown Nashville a couple of weeks ago, I had an extra half million people in the middle of downtown Nashville. I've been in downtown Nashville. I guarantee you this, they didn't even know where to park the first tenth of those folks. When you cram all those people in, it's hard to get around. So if the, even if you wanted to make a space for somebody to come through, man, that's four guys carrying a stretcher. 
That's a lot of space. You might not have been able to clear that off and let them through in anyway. So maybe the crowd can be forgiven for the fact that you can't quite get, they couldn't quite get through. What I love is that the friends here, they do what friends do. They don't give up. And we don't know what their relationship is with this guy. Probably know it's just one friend and three other guys he grabbed at randoms went ahead and carried on. And rather than, being, rather than slicing through the crowd, since they can't get there, they go up. They think about their problem, and they think about the different directions that you can solve it. By the way, just about any problem may have other directions you can go to solve it. We tend to think in side to side, you know, left, right. We also need to remember thinking up and down. They think up. And then we can come back down. Now, we don't know why this occurred to them. Maybe this is left over from high school prank days, and they knew, hey, wait a minute, there's always through the ceiling. We can talk some other time about why it is that, to me, it's perfectly logical to go through the ceiling to get to places. Here in a couple of weeks, uh, they're, they're bulldozing my old high school. Here, you know, here this summer as Jacksonville is, is building a new high school and so they're going to have an open house that you can go and take tours. And so I'm taking the kids to show them some things. Some things I'm only going to let Olivia see because she'll, she's graduating. She's done. Some things Angie and Stephen don't need to know yet until they're out of school. Um, I don't need them crawling through the ceiling at their school for several reasons. One, I don't need them in trouble. Two, they're homeschooled. <laughs> I'm not great at fixing ceilings. So, uh, but they, you know, we don't know why these guys thought of this quickly, but it's not uncommon. We know that building a, a house such that you can get up on the roof is common enough in the, in the land of Israel that the book of Leviticus gives instructions to make sure that you build a safety rail on your roof. That's back there as well as little small points of the law that we sometimes don't even notice. We just kind of read right over. It says, you know, when you build your house, when you build a flat roof, make sure that you build a guardrail so that people don't fall off. Because if somebody falls off your roof, you know, if you're up there and somebody just falls off and you build a guardrail, you're guilty of their blood. You know, this is personal liability. Going back to the but going back to early Israel, you needed insurance. <laughs> Except you just built a you, know, you built a rail to, to prevent that. So we know that this is common. Accessible roofs that you can get up onto, the places that you can that you can stand and, and be on. So we've got that. So they go up and promptly tear a hole in the roof to lower the guy down through. Which tells you not only did they bring him, but they apparently went out for supplies. Because I don't know about you, but I don't typically carry around the pickaxe that you need to cut through a roof. Nor do I typically carry around enough rope to lower a stretcher through a hole in the roof. And that was also not a common thing while ancient MacGyver may have done so. There weren't that many guys like that in that era. And so they did what they needed to do, and they got this man down in front of Jesus. And there's a whole additional discussion of the fact that the first thing Jesus tells him is that his sins are forgiven. It doesn't tell him he's healed. It tells him his sins are forgiven. Whatever you think your biggest need is, your actual biggest need is for your sins to be forgiven. Amen. No matter what you think you come to Jesus for, I need my heart healed. I need my back healed. I need my relationships healed. I need my nation healed. I need this healed. I need this. I need direction about the future. I need help with this. I need to understand that. I need to go this direction. Your real need first is that your sins be forgiven. Now sometimes we have to meet basic needs so that people will hear that and understand it. But we'll hit that again in a moment. The real need was for his sins to be forgiven. Of course, the Pharisees are going, that doesn't sound right. I mean, if you wouldn't care for it, if I came by your house and just kind of walked in in the middle of an argument in, in your home and just looked at you know, 
looked at your wife, looked at your husband after y'all been arguing, been laying out all the problems that they've done. And I just said, it's okay, your sins are forgiven. And just walked on. Say, wait a minute, I didn't, we didn't do anything to him. First time you intervene in somebody's life like that, you just look up and say, oh, your sins are forgiven. Bradley, just tell, just tell your dad, it's okay, all your sins are forgiven. You go home and tell him that, and he come put the hurt on me. You're like, no, 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 you don't even know what he's done. His sins weren't against you, they were this. See, the idea that Jesus could look at him and say, your sins are forgiven, the Israelites, the Jews, they understood this, and it's something we should understand as well. And it goes all the way back to David, when David in Psalm 51, and we see this, when he says, against you and you only have I sinned after he has sinned with Bathsheba, when he's committed adultery with a woman who really didn't have the opportunity to say no. When the king sends his personal armed bodyguard and says, hey, come to the king, what's she supposed to say? No. It can be a very painful no. So he's done that. He's failed to be with his army where he's supposed to be. He's murdered Uriah the Hittite. <coughs> And when Nathan the prophet confronts him for his sin, the thing that he recognizes is that his sin is ultimately, fully and truly, though he has sinned against Bathsheba, he's sinned against his army, he's sinned against the nation of Israel, he's sinned against Uriah, ultimately he's truly sinned against God first. See, so there's only two people that can, there's only two sources of forgiveness for your sin. One is forgiveness by the person that you have wronged, and the other that can override it is the God who that sin is ultimately, truly against. So for Jesus to look at this man and say, your sins are forgiven, it's not simply to pass off anything. It's not some psychological gobbledygook or jibber-jabber. It is a statement that I am God. I am permitted to forgive his sins. I don't have to know what he did, although we know Jesus did it. He says, I don't, you know, if they don't have to have been against me that you all can track down, now I can claim that it's this or that. He said, but since I am God, any of his sins are against me, and I can forgive them. This bothers the Pharisees. Sometimes this bothers us. Because we can make a list of the ways in which people have sinned against us, and we want to make sure that they get what's coming to them before we allow them to come into the presence of God. Tonight we'll observe the Lord's Supper and there's always that temptation to sit there and look, at, look around the room and go, I can't believe her. After what she said to me last week, how dare she come into the presence of God and worship. Now in all honesty, your conscience ought to be clear before God and before man before you take the Lord's Supper. Paul's pretty serious about that. Scripture's pretty serious about that. Lord's Supper is one of the most serious things that we do as a church because we remember the cost of our sins. But realize that the forgiveness to be granted is granted by God. Now, He has told us that if we know that we need somebody else's forgiveness, we need to go seek it. That's a different sermon for a different day. It's not for you to decide. It's not for me to decide who's forgiven and who's not. But the friends have brought this man before Jesus, and they've brought him there. Jesus forgives him, and then he says, okay, well, let's just make a point. Which one do you think is harder, to forgive sins or to make him walk? He says, but let's just make everything clear. His sins are forgiven, get up and walk, go. Take your stretcher and leave. Take up your bed and walk, go. And so from this, we catch a very important lesson. If you have friends who need Jesus, do what you can do to take them to Jesus. You see, oftentimes when we see the stories in the Gospels, one of the things that we should do is see what message is there for us. Well, since you're not Jesus and I'm not Jesus, I can't forgive your sins. You can't really forgive mine, not the ones that are against God. I can't heal you. You can't heal me. You know, trust me, I mean, if one of y'all actually, you know, if one of y'all's got that, uh, do me a favor because... <laughs> This afternoon, I won't be able to move my arm. Uh, but what we can do, we can be, make sure that we're not the Pharisees in the story, make sure we're not the teachers of the law in the story. 
there are times we have been the paralyzed man who needed his sins forgiven. But if you've got a relationship with Christ, that's not you anymore. Who you can be are the folks who try so hard to get this man in the presence of Jesus. They picked him up, they carried him, they cut a hole in the roof. They put a whole lot of effort into this. The people in your life that you can bring into the presence of Jesus you ought to. Now sometimes the way that looks is who can you invite to church? Who can you invite to Sunday school? Who can you invite don't invite them to go on a Pinnacle Mountain trip with the youth because we've got to cancel that otherwise it's never going to quit raining. Uh, it's going to be this, this week. No, rain. That week. Rain. That week. Rain. Look, Noah. We've got to stop. Um, you know, we got, we got to stop with, it, with, that, with that stuff. But, uh, you know, Bring them into this. Bring them to a Wednesday night small group. Bring them to Sunday night church. Bring them to something. <clears throat> Invite them into your home for a Bible study. Invite them to come with you. Invite them to you know, something where they'll hear the gospel. <clears throat> there are people in your life that are like this paralyzed man that you can load up. And if you'll do a decent chunk of, you know, if you'll do some of the work to bring them, they'll willingly come. All the research studies out there say that four out of five people in the United States of America would come to church if invited by a friend or a family member. Four out of five. And you may say, I, you know, I hadn't hit that yet. Well, you just play the averages. Eventually you'll get there. Fewer than 10% of people who don't have a church connection will come if invited as part of a church outreach program that doesn't know them, or an effort, you know, if they're just simply invited by a pastor or a Sunday school teacher that they don't know. Now, we still play those averages, too. We still take the one or two people that will respond out of a hundred that will respond you know, when I ask them, when I invite them to church. But the same person that will tell me no ten times will tell you yes the first time you say, will you come to church with me? Your neighbors will listen to you. They will respond. Some of your family will respond. Some of your family will not. That's just life these days. But there are people that you can invite and they will willingly come. And as a church, we need to make sure we make space for them. And also understand that if we don't make clear paths through the door, that occasionally we may have to cut a hole in the roof to get people into the presence of Jesus. But if they'll come because we've cut a hole in the roof, that at least they've come. Roofs can always be replaced. So we need to make that effort. But there's another group of people as well. And if you flip over to John 11, or it's up there on the screen, maybe. Yes, it is. John 11. John 11 is the story, it is, is the other group of people in our lives. See, there's basically three groups of people in your life. There's the people that know Jesus, and you just need to encourage them as they, as they follow him. There's the people who don't know Jesus, but if you will help bring them to him, they'll come. And then there's the third group of people. And that's the folks that they're not going to come one way or the other. And I think there's something we can learn about that from the story of Lazarus. Now, this is where Lazarus is dead. And Jesus has come to Bethany where Lazarus is dead and he's buried. And everybody is weeping. And Jesus asks him this question in John 11. He says, where have you put him? Referring to Lazarus. Lord, they told him, Come and see. There are some people that you can bring to Jesus. If you've got to carry the stretcher, carry the stretcher. But there are some people that the only way that we will get the gospel to them is if we will go into the midst of the graveyards in which they are and carry the gospel to them. Today, for example, marks the beginning of the month of Ramadan in the Islamic world as people in that part of, as, as people of that faith begin to change. They change their habits for the month. 
to observe and fast and pray and, and, and eat crazy as well in an effort to well, in, in an effort to, to please God in their minds. Many of the, many folks of that faith will never come into a church. And the same reason that most of us would never darken the door of a mosque. What do we need to do? We need to carry the gospel into the graveyards in which they live. That they would see Jesus in us. There are people who live surrounded, counted by the things of this world in such a way that they're not going to come into a church. Maybe they had a bad experience in a church. Maybe somebody was very, very mean to them. It doesn't happen. Some of you may not believe it, but it does happen in church that folks can be mean. And contrary to, to the old rhyme from elementary school that sticks to stones can break our, home, our bones, but words will never hurt us, words actually can be very damaging to a person. And sometimes the words of church people have put up such a barrier that rather than being in and amongst godly people who are willing to be carried to Jesus in the midst of the church, we have to go into the graveyard that folks have chosen to live in because we've driven them out from among us. And we need to go and to carry because we can either bring people to Jesus and some folks will come, but other folks we have got to take Jesus to. Through the way that we live, through the way that we talk, through the ministry that we are engaged in. Some people will come. They're curious. They want to know. Some people will come because they're friendly and they're polite and they want to know. They want to hear. Some people will come because, hey, I came to have fun and then I heard about Jesus and I got saved. Some people will not come because they are so dead, so hardened, and so deafened by all the things around them that the only way is if someone will walk right up to the edge of their tomb and say, Jesus, this is where they are. And then from there, let the power of the gospel and the word of God draw them out and bring them to life. Some people we can carry to Jesus. Some people we've got to take Jesus to. But either way we slice it, we have things that we need to do about this. Number one, we need to walk through life with our eyes open, not for business opportunities, not for, for fun opportunities, but for opportunities to take the gospel to people. We have to build relationships, not for the purpose of growing a church, but for the purpose of spreading the word of God and expanding the kingdom of God that people would come to Christ. Those of you who are at points in your life where you're ready to set out on new ventures, whether you're finishing high school, college, maybe you're just done with the job that you've got and you want to go find a different one. Maybe you're done with the job that you've got and you don't want to go find a different one. You can actually at a point you can retire and not have to do any of it. Great. God didn't provide you with those opportunities that you would sit and do nothing, but he provided you with that opportunity that you could see other opportunities and greater chances and greater, greater places to carry the gospel into that you would have opportunities to build relationships with people that would draw them to Jesus, that you would have opportunities to take your life and center it in places that you're able to point people to Christ. Because the center of carrying the gospel is not this building, it's not that building back there, it's not any piece of this property, but it's the lives of the people that God has put here. And I want to be where your life is as a sinner of the, care, of the light of the gospel. So what has God enabled your life to become? What, is, what opportunity has God provided you that you could do it? What opportunity has God provided us as a church that we could do this?
Some people will come in, and we ought to do things that encourage people to come in. Others we have to go out to. Some of them we have we can go out to, and they'll end up coming back here. Others we need to go out to, and they'll never come here. It's too far of a drive. Because there are people that we need to carry the gospel to, whether they're in Mexico or Canada or in Europe, Asia, Africa, all around the world. There are places that we can go to carry the gospel to. But generally speaking, we tend to be afraid. We don't like to go into graveyards. It's scary. It's dark. It's unclean. The people there stinketh. That was one of the concerns about Lazarus. They say, Jesus says, roll the stone away. It's, no, no, no. It's four days dead. But we need to stop and think about the folks that we've written off because we've decided that they stink it. There's a mighty smell that surrounds folks and we say, oh, we don't want that brought in here. We don't want those people who don't understand that God created male and female and did that for a reason. We don't want the folks who are like this or who are like that. We don't want those people that don't speak English well. We don't want those people that aren't from around here. We don't want those people, in all honesty, we don't want those people that, if they, didn't, if they weren't born and raised around here, we, we kind of fill up on our quota of strangers around here. We don't want those people that, you know, that don't, don't function like we function. We don't want those folks who's, whose minds aren't fully there. We don't want those folks whose bodies aren't, aren't really supporting them. You know, it's one thing for them to need glasses, but you know, if they need Braille Sunday School literature, or if we need deaf interpreters, we're not sure about that. We don't want those folks that are too needy. We certainly don't want to go to places filled with folks like that. We don't want to go into the Muslim world and tell people about Jesus. They don't like us very much there. Yeah. They need Jesus anyway. We don't want those people from down there at the border. We don't want to go there. We don't want them to come here. Still need Jesus whether you want them to come here or not. Whether you want to go there or not. We don't want those people from that school system and this school system and this and that and the other. We don't want to go there in the midst of that. But we need to be willing to go into the graveyards of this world and carry Jesus with us. Because when he said that where two or three of, uh, uh, or more, two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them. So we ought to be in the prisons, in the poorhouses, in those abandoned places of this world where the darkness is the greatest. The light of the world needs to be taken there, that it would shine. <coughs> and then that we would be welcoming to those who come in. Can you imagine? People gathered around to hear Jesus preach, looked up, there's a hole in the roof, guys being lowered down. As soon as the stretcher comes down, four people grab the four poles on it and carry him to the back and say, Nope, you got to wait your turn. We find that ridiculous. And yet we go to great lengths at times to bring people in that they would hear the gospel. Do we ever look at it and say, look at somebody that comes in? doesn't quite fit and say, no, nope. wait your turn. You're not quite enough like us yet. Sorry, paralyzed guy. We know you got here as best you can, but you're not dressed quite right for us. Come back when you can be dressed like you should. Sorry, child, that didn't grow up in church. We know that it was a, it's a stretch to get you here. We know that it's hard to sit still and listen because none of us really like to sit still and listen. 
Most of us that can do it learned it because we were threatened within an inch of our lives for it. And finally, either learned how to do it or became preachers so that we don't have to sit still in the same church. Sorry, person has no background in church at all, has no idea what we're doing. Until you can figure out how to follow a church service and sit still and be quiet. We really don't want you in here until you figure that out. Don't want the noise. Sorry, a person who worships a little differently than we do, maybe with more enthusiasm, maybe with less. Some people can be so caught in the presence of God in their worship that they are very happy sitting still, being very quiet, communing one with the Father. Some people like to stand up and shout. Some people also like to handle snakes, and that we're really not comfortable with. <laughs> That one we really need to talk about before we do that here. But we need to be understanding of the fact that just because it doesn't look like us and doesn't fit our parameters, sorry, paralyzed guy. We know that you're here, and we know that great effort was put to put in to bring you here, but you don't quite fit with us yet, so slide on to the back. Come back when you put a tie on. Come back when you don't put a tie. For the record, I'm wearing a tie today so I can wear my little dinosaur tie clip. <laughs> Come back when you're this. You need to say, you know what? Now that you're here, we're glad you're here. What we want you to see is we want you to see Jesus. We want you to draw near to the Lord and Savior. We want you to come to the king of the universe, to the sovereign over all creation, and we want to let God work in your life. And it may take years for you to develop some of the habits that we think that you should have, but you know what? We grew up, most of us grew up in church, many of us did, and we, we've had them for a long time. We have different sins to, come, to get over. Some people haven't had a lifetime of churchiness to, to, to build on. So let's let it be possible that people can bring folks to Jesus. But ultimately, it's a matter of recognizing that if our sins have been forgiven, He can forgive others as well. It's a matter of acknowledging that if we need the gospel, that others need the gospel as well. And it may be that that's the first point that we need to start with. And you come to that point that you've let Jesus, that you've seen Jesus forgive your sins, that you've surrendered to Christ as Lord. If not, you need to make that right today. Maybe that you need to come here in a moment. We'll have our time of meditation after we pray. You may need to come and pray and ask God to, to clear your heart and open your eyes to the people around you that need the Savior. Whatever it is, we need to take an action whether it's in our own hearts of making a commitment to God that we will actually keep, whether it's in how we spend our afternoon, whether it's in coming and saying, I need, I need to know more about this Jesus, whatever it is. Let's not let the day pass by when we say, well, there's one more. 52 sermons a year, we'll check. This, this checks off one of them. Almost done. I'm like, not even halfway there yet. Whatever it is, we're going to pray and then we'll go to our time of invitation. Be praying that God shows you how you need to respond. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love and your grace. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to follow you well and to serve you well. We pray that you will help us to respond to what you've given us in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we come to our time of invitation. Scott and Carla and Jay are going to come and lead us as we sing. And what we'll do is we'll stand together and we'll sing the words there on the screen. And maybe you need to come and ask for prayer for something. Maybe, maybe you need to come and ask what it is to follow after Christ. Whatever it is, I'll be standing here in front of you and talk with you and pray with you.